family march in Logan Square to protest police violence. Adam, we love you. You have allowed police officers to traumatize us, Mark Clements, a survivor of police violence, told the crowd. Wait, was he telling the crowd that they allowed police officers to traumatize them? It's a bit confusing. Anyway, um, after gatherings in Logan Square Park, thousands of protesters began marching north on Milwaukee Avenue Friday night. Yeah, um, they marched outside of to outside of the mayor's house. Um, Lori Lightfoot, who is a huge cop supporter, fucking former, um, former, uh, prosecutor, I believe. Uh, yeah. Yeah, she was a prosecutor. Um, just, yeah, she's just a real piece of shit. Hundreds of people gathered in front of Logan Square Monument Friday evening, holding signs demanding justice for 13-year-old Adam Toledo, who was shot and killed by a Chicago police officer in Little Village late last month. Okay, there's that quote from Mark Clements again. We're out here because we watched a child gunned down by the Chicago police. Where's the integrity? Clements said. Uh... I want this whole park to rock, Clements shouted. We're throwing Mayor Lori Lightfoot. We're showing, sorry, throwing. We're showing Mayor Lori Lightfoot no more. We're showing the governor no more. We're showing Tony Preckwinkle no more. Preckwinkle, the Cook County Board President, was at the event but did not address the crowd. Um, she was also in the running for Chicago mayor um, in the last mayoral race. Many speakers became emotional, crying as they called for justice for Adam and others killed by police. Adam, we love you. We will not stop until there is justice for you, the crowd shouted in unison. From other speakers, there also were demands for rent control, better jobs, and funding for youth-driven social programs. To accomplish this, some organizers said that they should reduce funding for the Chicago Police Department and use the money to improve social programs instead. Wow. What what a what a crazy thought. What a wild thought. <laughs> like, mm, maybe we should stop fucking giving money to people who shoot our children. <laughs> Emilio Jose Torres and Andre Morris Andre Morris, both nineteen, said they wanted to see the city put money in disinvested communities rather than the police department. So <sighs> I want to jump right here to a pretty fucking I don't know classic um classic thing so there, there's a huge argument that like well you know there's a huge problem of gun violence in Chicago and I'm not saying there's not um I'm not gonna say there's like gun violence isn't a problem and that like yeah there are fucking gangs and that like like Chicago like yeah, there there are heavily there are heavy gun laws in in the city of Chicago in in Illinois, um, but right across the border is Indiana where gun laws are a lot less um, lax. That is far less the problem. I mean, it's uh, sure it's a problem that gun laws are are more lax, I guess, um, but that's not really what makes people shoot other people, <laughs> especially in gang related shit. Um, all of that is lack of access to, um, I don't know, school, housing, um, food, money, like, uh, I don't know if y'all are familiar with, uh, redlining, but Chicago is a massively segregated city and, um, the black and brown populations live in, you know, not just on the south side, but, you know, <laughs> I appreciate that, Zach. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, some, like, pick-me-up stuff is definitely encouraged in this since we're reading a lot of depressing-ass shit, because, hey, we live in a fascist country. <laughs> like, we... We pretty much just live in a fucking fascist country. That's fucking great, folks. Oh, jeez. Oh, so, 
Um. <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> but again, it's not the guns that are the biggest problem. It's the massive poverty. It's the it's the the like lack of health care, the lack of food, the lack of uh, education, the lack of fucking jobs, the lack of af- affordable housing. Um, like, if you keep people poor and pent up, the only recourse they're going to have is violence. Um, and what does the state like to do instead of yeah, the abundance of monopolies, exactly, Zach. Um, what does the state like to do instead of alleviate those problems? They like to try and punish them away. They like to punish them into submission, which is why we have literally, like, uh, what's the, we're gonna look it up right now. The Chicago Police Department's budgeted spending across all funds, including grant funds, for 2020 totals $1.76 billion, billion with a B, billion dollars, 1.6 billion dollars for cops in this fucking city. The Chicago Police Department makes up 37% of the 4.4 billion corporate fund. However, budget, budgeted police department spending across all funds of 1.6 76 billion makes up approximately 15% of the city's total budget of 11.6 billion dollars including grants. Yeah, shoot shoot uh we always know the world's populations are countries populations. Uh-huh. But wonder the number of families? Mm. That's an interesting question. Um although there's there's a little bit of a problem trying to calculate that statistic um census kind of does um but but there there is a problem it, it's not family the census doesn't doesn't count families necessarily as household as it does households and like that's what it counts as like a family but well, no, it's not just that, um, it's not just that people break up for easily from families. It's how do you, like, how do you quantify that? Or, like, what is your qualifications of a family, right? Like, are you talking about, like, a, like, a nuclear family? Are we talking about an extended family? Are we talking about, like, what is, what is the, I guess what I'm asking is, like, what the statistic is useful for? in useful in determining or useful in understanding like w- what what are we trying to understand when we ask the question groups of people that share a lump sum of money so are we just talking about shared bank accounts then plus children um because like also not all families share bank accounts you know um they might pool resources like how do you quantify that um Like, you know, how, I don't, I don't know. Um, it, it's, I, I guess, if, are we talking, I guess you're talking about, like, a financial unit, basically. Um, a financial unit of people that act together uh, to support each other financially, basically. Even if they don't share banks, they'd spend money on each other, I'd assume. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. Y- yeah, I guess I guess my question is just like what be- because like you know f- family means so many different things to many different people. Capitalism has helped pare that down into like you know smaller and smaller groups, right? Um, until we have like the nuclear family. But like you know, there's plenty of like extended families that like you know multiple houses, but they all pool resources and stuff. I don't know. Um, that is a tough question to, to, to answer though. Okay. So CPD budget for 2020 was 1.6, 1.76 billion. Okay. So the 
Uh, I grew up in the Humboldt Park in Logan Square area before it was gentrified, and I've seen crime firsthand, Torres said. And I can tell you right now, the way to stop crime is not by policing people. Oh, surprise, surprise. Uh, it's by finding resources to make sure kids have education and kids have a decent home. Criminals don't just appear out of nowhere, which is exactly what I was talking about. Added Morris, we need more power, and that's what we're trying to do. That's why we're gathered. This is our power. This is our speech. Uh, hundreds packed into Logan Square Park on Friday to protest the fatal shooting of Chicago by Chicago police of a th of 13-year-old Adam Toledo. After a 90-minute rally in the park, the crowd marched north on Milwaukee Ave, fill filling the road, waving signs and chanting and chanting. Some also protested the fatal shooting by police of Anthony Alvarez, 22, killed about two days after Adam. I forgot that that happened, honestly. Um, no justice, no peace, abolish police, some yelled as diners in the popular business district looked on through restaurant windows. I remember seeing that a lot last summer when we would go through downtown because, you know, even though, even though it was technically like lockdown, there was still like outdoor dining was happening and you just saw these like fucking bougie white people like sitting, eating their fucking burgers or whatever and like watching us uh, crowd the streets after, you know, police for the murder of George Floyd, for Breonna Taylor, for fuck, so, so many people. Um, they killed a 13-year-old kid with his hands up, said Nate Branford, 20, a student at the University of Chicago. They've been killing us for a while now. So I figured I'd come to, to yet another protest to scream yet another name. When the crowd reached the point where Milwaukee crossed Diversity and Kimball Avenues, they formed a large circle and chants to abolish the police resumed. After about 15 minutes there, they resumed their march heading west on Diversity, then south on Hamlin to Fullerton, where they again formed a circle for another small rally before marching back east on Fullerton to Kedzie, then returning to the park. I know I just said a lot of street names. They just walked in a, a big circle, basically. Uh, there was a brief standoff between protesters and police at Central Park and Wrightwood Avenues, not far from the home of Mayor Lori Lightfoot. About 100 demonstrators who broke off of the main march lined up and yelled at the police there before heading back to rejoin the larger crowd. Marching through Logan Square side streets, shouting, hands up, don't shoot. We chanted that a lot last year, too. Other than that, though, the march remained peaceful and without incident until the very end as the crowd was dispersing. That's when police apprehended a man for reasons that were unclear. Hmm. He was placed in a squad car, but as soon as that car's siren went off, other demonstrators converged, blocking the squad car and keeping it from leaving. Yes. Fuck yes. Um... The car was blocked only briefly. Police pushed and shoved some people out of the way, eventually allowing it to leave. Some remaining protesters continued to shout and yell at officers. A second man was also was a second man also was seen handcuffed and detained by police. Um, the crowd peaked at around 1,000 and stayed there even four hours after the rally started, and more than two hours of marching. Andrea Popoka, 26, didn't expect the protest to turn out to be as big as it did, but was pleased at the turnout. We're here to show our support for the community in this unjustified murder, Popoka said, holding a sign with Adam's name on it. That video was sickening, and we were mortified when we saw it. Popoka said the video showed a trigger-happy officer who needs to be fired and charged. This keeps happening, and it simply needs to stop, she added. As the march twisted and turned through the northwest side neighborhood, TV helicopters flew above. Yeah, they were f flying all, like, for quite a while. Um, monitoring the protests, police blocked intersections, allowing the peaceful demonstration to move around. Jane Lee Rod 
Rodriguez Yanni Rodriguez, I guess. Melissa Vasquez, both 17, came from the south side to march, driven by rage at Adam's killing. To see a 13-year-old boy who was cooperating in the end with the cops to still get shot, it's just something that left a mark on me and left me really mad, Rodriguez said. Oh, little typo. <laughs> uh, because it's like they can ask us to do something and we can do it, and in the end we'll still get shot. Uh... Manny Ramos is a core member in Report for America, a not-for-profit journalism program that aims to bolster Sun Times coverage of issues affecting Chicago's South and West Sides. Yeah. So. That's that. That is... that that was uh this weekend so far in chicago um let's uh let's move to where where are we going where are we going from here yeah it's been a it's been a bad 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 week uh our city and some uh, neighboring communities have been placed under a large-scale military occupation. Law enforcement officers are practicing an astonishing, well-coordinated wholesale violation of people's civil rights. Community si community cries uh, to reform one of the most racist policing systems in the country have been roundly ignored for nearly a year at every level of government. What the hell was I thinking not to have you on my list of follows? Like, who am I? Like, God, I totally mess. <laughs> I thought you were following me, honestly. Um, but thanks for following me, dude. I uh, appreciate it. Um, that's okay. Like, that's, that's okay. Um, I'm, I'm not, I, I ain't mad at you. <laughs> um. So, yeah, community cries to reform, ignored for nearly a year at every level of government. Four journalists and reporters are being rounded up, cataloged, arrested, and driven away from protests to prevent them from documenting illegal actions by law enforcement. Uh, LEOs are firing chemical weapons and less lethal munitions on protesters, even when kneeling or prone. Six, no level of government has spent any resources to to date to guarantee access to healing spaces or opportunities to grieve for mourning residents. 7. The law enforcement apparatus overseeing all of this is a murky, multi-jurisdictional apparatus called Operation Safety Net. That doesn't sound fucking ominous. Uh, where decision-making is unclear and residents have very little ability to express concerns or practice accountability. I'm going to pause right here for a second because I'm always a little, mm, I always feel a little weird when people start talking about accountability, mostly because like, I don't know, accountability doesn't seem to mean a whole lot anyway. Um, it's a pretty nebulous term in my view, um, but, but I, I, get where where they're going uh eight the law enforcement has provided virtually no protection for protesters from the threats of white supremacists and other right-wing extremists obviously because the cops are right-wing extremists um like <laughs> you can see it at pretty much any any time there are right-wingers and left like a visible delineation between right-wingers and left-wingers at a protest um, right-wingers will commit violence and left-wingers will get arrested. So, uh, nine law enforcement has spent thousands of dollars safeguarding the private property of the officer who shot and killed Dante Wright. Dante Wright, sorry. Um, uh, 10, the criminal case against the officer who killed Dante Wright 
what is currently being led by a prosecutor who has provided volunteer legal services to the Minneapolis Police Chiefs Association for nearly 30 years. And that's without even mentioning all the trauma and bullshit associated with the ongoing murder trial against Derek Chauvin. Yeah, remember that this is happening in the same city where um, Derek Chauvin is is being tried for the murder of George Floyd. Oh, I'm sure he gets like sweet kickbacks for working with the police for free, honestly. And probably gr great um, publicity for his bullshit. <sighs> In Minneapolis, the Minnesota Freedom Fighters tried to keep the peace. Brooklyn Center, Minneapolis, uh, Associated Press. As protests intensified in the uh, Minneapolis suburb where a police officer fatally shot Dante Wright, a group of black men joined the crowd intent on keeping the peace and preventing protesters from escalating into violence. Oh, it's the protesters who are escalating into violence. Great. <laughs> sure it is. Wonderful. So hundreds of people have gathered outside the heavily guarded Brooklyn Center Police Station every night since Sunday, when former officer Kim Potter, who is white, shot the 20-year-old black motorist during a traffic stop. Despite the mayor's calls for law enforcement and protesters to scale back their tactics, the nights have often ended in objects hurled, tear gas, and arrests. The black men at the edge of the crowd wear yellow patches on protective vests that identify them as members of the Minnesota Freedom Fighters, a group formed to provide security in Minneapolis's north side neighborhoods during unrest following the death of George Floyd last year. So they're basically unarmed cops. <laughs> That's what it sounds like. They're not shy about casting a forceful image the group's facebook page features members posing with assault style weapons described at itself as an elite security unit oh okay so they are armed great fucking great but on friday the freedom fighters didn't appear to be armed okay the <laughs> i should just read ahead holy shit uh, but on Friday, the Freedom Fighters didn't appear to be armed and said they intended only to encourage peaceful protesting. Um, when I opened my account on Twitch, on my list of followers, there are new people I never even met. Like, I have met ASM Marxists on stream chats. Like, there are people that have not met, I've not met on stream chats that I am following. Like, people I've never gotten from Suggest did follows either. Maybe I just show up on my list of follows. Yeah, that's weird. Yeah, I don't, I don't know why that's happening to you, dude. That, that is fucking wild. Um, uh, several people began... Uh, oh, wait. But on Friday, they intended only to encourage peaceful protesting. By whose definition of peaceful? Um, as several people began to rattle a fence protecting the Brooklyn Center Police Department, the Freedom Fighters communicated to each other over walkie-talkies. They declined to say how many are, are in their group. In recent nights, the Freedom Fighters have moved through the crowd in formation, wearing body armor and dark clothing, where weaving past umbrella-wielding demonstrators to create separation along a double-layered perimeter security fence. Their passive tactics are intended to de-escalate the tension, preventing agitators from pressing forward and provoking the law enforcement officers standing at attention with pepper ball and less lethal sponge grenades, grenade launchers at the ready. Um, could be neuro. I, I, I don't know. I've never had that problem. So I, I, I don't know. Um, let's, let's look at this sentence real quick. Their passive tactics are intended to de-escalate the tension, prevent, preventing agitators from pressing, from pressing forward and provoking law enforcement officers standing at attention with pepper balls and less lethal sponge grenade launchers at the ready. Um. Violent response is protocol. There are no police communication liaisons for org leaders. 
yeah, so <laughs> this is manu like big manufacturing consent, right? <laughs> like, like this is to say that <laughs> this is trying to say that oh well, the only the only reason that that protests get become violent, obviously it's not it's not directly saying this, but it's implying this that um, these people are trying to de-escalate the s situation by interlo like interweaving into these into protests basically to infiltrate protests right they're infiltrating protests to prevent agitators from agitating the cops to use their riot shit um not that the cops don't just use their fucking riot gear willy-nilly which they fucking do um but that no they actually are provoked to to use force when we know that police agitate like police are the agitators not protesters obviously every so often um you know people do you know whatever do stuff some people do uh commit property damage um but or like throw shit but i don't know it's a completely disproportionate and out, like, completely out of proportion response. <sighs> we can keep it peaceful, said Tyrone Hartwell, a 36-year-old former U.S. Marine who belongs to the group. There's always somebody in the group that wants to incite something, adding that throwing objects at police takes the focus away from their calls for justice and saps energy from the movement. I don't think it does. Um, I, I don't fucking agree with that, honestly. Like, I don't think it saps any energy away from the movement. Especially when, um, police response is to shoot people <laughs> with pepper balls and sponge grenades and gas canisters and tear gas. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? Minneapolis is on edge, simultaneously watching the trial of former police officer Derek Chauvin in Floyd's death and reeling from the shooting of Wright. In the midst of that, Hartwell said the freedom fighters are trying to push the movement for racial justice forward while keeping at bay the violence and destruction that often acutely affects minority communities. <sighs> breaking, breaking up protests doesn't... Um, <laughs> doesn't stop doesn't prevent violence in people's communities especially since most of the most of the stuff that happens in those protests um <laughs> yeah you're completely right dev uh dev says complaining about police fascism and being punished for it justifiably is getting normalized way too much yeah absolutely um like people aren't protesting uh as much in their communities as they are at the fucking like this protest is happening at the brooklyn center police station that's not like in their community that is at the fucking police station i mean obviously it's it's i don't I, I, I assume it's in, like, you know, it's in a community, but most police stations aren't, like, you know, aren't, like, in a residential area. There might, I mean, they're not, like, directly, like, in the middle of a residential area, right? Um, <clears throat> that's what I mean. The Brooklyn Center Department flew the thin blue line flag right after the murder. Of course they fucking did, because they're a bunch of fucking reactionary cops. This is a very difficult time in the history of this country. U.S. Uh, Representative Maxine Waters, a Democrat from California, who joined the protest on Saturdays. Uh, we have let people know that we are not going to be satisfied unless we get justice in these areas. The 82-year-old congresswoman and decried the 11 p.m. curfew set by authorities as a way to tamp down on demonstrations and encouraged the crowd to, of roughly 150 people to stay in the street. 
But local residents have also suffered from the nightly clashes between law enforcement and demonstrators, Hartwell said. He pointed at the apartments across the street from Brooklyn Center Police Department where residents have complained of tear gas streaming into their home. <clears throat> hey, you know who's not shooting tear gas into homes? It's not the fucking protesters. Like, it's not protesters shooting tear gas into people's homes. It is the police. <laughs> the Freedom Fighters formed after the NAACP put out a call for armed men to organize and protect their neighborhoods from looting and arson fl following Floyd's death. Oh my god. <laughs> Hartwell said groups of white people had come into predominantly black communities and harassed children. Of course they did. They've also formed relationships with the city government and police department. City spokeswoman Sarah McKenzie said there are several formal and informal relationships with members of the Freedom Fighters, but it does not fund or contract with the organization because it is an armed group. However, some demonstrators said that those ties mean the freedom fighters act at the behest of the police and are not aggressive enough in calling them into account. Um, yeah, that's almost certainly true. The freedom fighters have clashed this week with umbrella carrying demonstrators intent on provoking law again, intent on provoking law enforcement officers. Uh, on Saturday, members of the group removed a group of of demonstrators who had tried to cut the chains connecting the fence outside the police department. For much of the night, the street outside the police department was more subdued than in previous nights. Protesters chanted and spat insults towards the police, but at times also danced to music. Law enforcement also refrained from firing the flashbang canisters and sponge grenades they had employed on previous nights, and as curfew passed, law enforcement officers did not advance on the crowd. Instead, it mostly dissipated on its own. Another group of protesters tried... Oh, sorry, I've got, like, hairs in my mouth. Ugh. Another group of protesters tried a different tack by traveling to Stillwater, Minnesota to protest the home of Washington County Attorney Pete Orpit, who to push him to bring more severe charges against Potter. A crowd of roughly 100 people marched through the streets of his neighborhood. One of the organizers of the protest, lawyer and activist Nakima Levy Armstrong, said Orpit came out of his home at one point to explain why his office charged Potter with second-degree manslaughter instead of more severe murder charges. <laughs> Yeah, def uh, that's why I have this button, <laughs> uh, so that when uh, I'm about to say something spicy, I can hit that and mute my mic and just, you know, go off for a second. Um, <laughs> uh, do -do 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 -do. One of the organizers of the protest... Uh, lawyer, and, okay, she said uh, second degree murder instead of more severe murder charges. She credited him with engaging with the protesters, something she said never happened with Hennepin County attorney Mike Freeman after Floyd died. Um, again, Floyd was murdered. Uh, the Minnesota attorney general eventually took over prosecution and Freeman sold his home after frequent protests. Hmm, I wonder. But... Levi Armstrong uh, indicated they would not let up the pressure on Orput, saying, We are committed to continuing to have conversations with him until we see some murder charges. Thank you for watching this video. I hope you enjoyed. And if you did so, please consider giving this video a thumbs up and subscribing to my channel if you haven't done so already. I've got my Twitch and Twitter handles up above, and they will also be posted as links in the description of this video, along with some of the other stuff that I do, including ways to support me and my SoundCloud page where I've put some music up there. If 
you want to participate in these videos, Twitch is where we do that. We record these live and then I cut them together into a more cohesive ASMR video. So consider following us there. I hope you enjoyed and we'll see you next time.